Get as close to the mic as you reasonable. This is, okay. This is quite literally a work in progress, and I was editing, trying to get down to, to, to length, about 10 minutes before I came in tonight, so keep that in mind. This is actually a piece from a longer work I'm working on right now, and the holiday that I was given, since I didn't have to go with a legitimate holiday of the season, uh, this is built around the summer solstice. Okay. <clears throat> From the western edge of Cambridge, the road would take Jake Dubois to Concord, Massachusetts, climbed up and over a ridge of rocky hills near the border of Arlington and Lexington. They weren't terribly tall hills, more like a geological smudge, some bit of coastline thumbnailed inward by a god deciding to gouge a bay into this part of the coastline. Jake remembered hearing once that one could find marine fossils in the older rocks of those hills, which he knew should not surprise him, but somehow always did. The land did not lend itself to the drama of ancient marine life, sublimated tectonic plates and geological uplift. This was Arlington, for God's sake. Who told him of the fossils? He could see a face. He could tell you about the man's passion for biking, his curiously bulging muscles where his quads came to the head at the knee. But his name? Gone. How could he retain such trivia as a single passing statement about marine fossils, or remember the biker's quads so clearly, and not remember a name? Out of the blue then, a terrifying question. What if he couldn't remember the names of the people at the reunion? What if he couldn't even recognize any of them? It occurred to Jake that the mental images he had of the classmates were all from 20 years ago. He hadn't kept in touch with anyone. He hadn't been to any previous reunions. And yet there he was, on the evening of the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, heading to a country club on the outskirts of Concord to attend his 20th high school reunion. What had he been thinking? What petty vengeance had driven him to this stupidity? The sudden appearance of a hot air balloon directly in front of him, just over the crest of the hill, drove these questions from his mind. Jake's first impression was that the balloon had landed in the road beyond the horizon, and that he might, in fact, drive the aging Volvo right into his dangling wicker gondola. But as he crested the hill, he saw the bright orange jet flame roar beneath the mouth of the brightly colored balloon, and Jake realized that it was at least 200 feet away. A moment later, the flame ceased as suddenly as it had begun, yet the balloon's brightly colored gores quivered with the superheated air roiled around like kittens in a sack. Jake felt a prickling on the inside of his head and shuddered. This was not happening in the car before. The gores began to glow with a kind of oversaturated intensity. The long blue gore was the first to change, from a shade of that, that was pleasant enough but still of nondescript blue to a bright Prussian blue. Beside it, a red gore suddenly glowed scarlet, bright, and angry as an aneurysm about to blow. The green gore took on a deep emerald sheen, the sheen of Robin's eyes when she and Jake first started dating. Jake blinked rapidly and shook his head, gripping the wheel tightly. He glanced in the mirrors and over his shoulder, but no driver seemed perturbed by his shuddering. He glanced up again at the balloon. The saturated greens, reds, and blues had all returned to the hues of his first impressions. The intensity had passed, and he felt a pang. He wondered whether the saturated colors had begun to, he had begun to see with increasing frequency were the thing's true colors, which he had been too dull to see before, or whether the duller colors he was accustomed to seeing were the true colors that were being compromised during these moments of heightened awareness. He didn't have an aware answer for that question. He didn't even know why he was now seeing things so vividly. At Robin's insistence, more to placate her than anything else, he had finally gone to the doctor, who did a full workup and ran a battery of tests, all of which confirmed that Jake was a healthy 38-year-old male with slightly elevated triglycerides and a midriff that could stand to lose 20 pounds. There were no markers indicating any kind of tumor, no sign indicating any kind of lurking cardiovascular event, no reason at all, in fact, for Jake to believe that his days were numbered, which changed nothing. Jake knew what he knew. He now had 273 days left. This summer solstice, this longest day, would be his last. From here, the days would grow shorter. The door to the Fieldstone Fells Club opened as Jake approached, and a woman in white caftan stepped out, all smiles and tennis tan. She looked at him and then refer referenced a clipboard. At last, Jake Dubois? Her voice tripped with something, though Jake could not tell what, with whether it was incredulity or genuine pleasure. A guy Fox smiled from Jake, in the flesh. So good of you to come, bubbled the woman. It's me, Tony Martin. She embraced Jake with a dramatic air kiss, and Jake vaguely recalled that she had been homecoming queen or prom queen or something like that during the senior year. As best he could tell, they had never had a conversation in high school. 
look at you, she said, standing back and making a show of looking him up and down, and then leaning in close to look at the picture on the badge he held. You don't look any different. How did you do that? You should see the picture in my attic. She gave him a blank look. Dork joke, he said. That hasn't changed either. She brightened. Go on in. The reception room was large, with tables for eight laid out around a square dance floor. A DJ was spinning up tunes from the 70s, but no one was dancing. A scrum of plaid sports jackets and re receding hairlines occupied the far corner of the room, and one of their number appeared to be recounting a moment of football glory. For a moment, Jake found it impossible to imagine any of them as his high school classmates. If these were the jocks from his class, and he was pretty certain they were, then it struck Jake that they were, the most, they were more pathetic now than they had been when he was, they had tormented him for his clumsiness on the field and lack of familiarity with the rules of the game. Jake was waiting for a gin and tonic to show up at the bar when a, deep, a profoundly deep voice from behind him said, Brother Dubois, I was hoping you'd be here tonight. Jake inhaled deeply and wished he had a chance to have at least a sip of the drink before dealing with the jocks, but no. He turned around slowly and found himself facing the most famous jock in his class, the classmate with whom he shared nothing but a last name. Trevor Dubois had the skin the color of midnight, stood six foot eight inches tall and weighed in at around 325 pounds, every pound of which still seemed to be muscle. He had been the star of the football team. He had caught every pass thrown in his general direction, raced down the field with stunning speed, scored goal after goal, gone on to Michigan State for a scholarship, and then on to apparently a successful career, career on the Denver team, or Dallas. Jake didn't follow football, so he honestly didn't know. Now Trevor Dubois stood before Jake Dubois in a well-cut Italian suit, his hand extended, a smile on his face that Jake thought seemed genuine. Brother Dubois, Jake replied warily. Still, he reached out and shook the offered hand. Trevor's handshake was strong, but not crushing. Are you still playing football? I heard you went into the pros. Congratulations. Trevor chuckled and smiled. No, I left the pros long ago. I'm down at Howard now. Coaching? Not in the way you were thinking. I run a leadership program in the business school. After I left the pros, I went back and did my doctorate in education. I focus on leadership training and enterprise development. Whoa. And you had something to do with that. That's why I was hoping you'd be here tonight. Jake raised an eyebrow. That surprises you. I always assumed you saw me as a geek, an embarrassment with the same last name. Trevor shook his head. No, not really. I always admired your smarts. I envied the fact that you could be so comfortable in your skin and do just exactly what you did. You liked being smart. You had intellectual curiosity. I wanted to be like that, but I really wasn't like it was an option. I was a big black kid who was gifted at football. That was my path forward. A buzzing suddenly began to emanate from the watch on Jake's wrist. He froze for a moment, then reached over and silenced it. What's that? Summer solstice, Jake said quietly. It's the moment when the Earth's tilt. What's the northern hemisphere closest to the sun, Trevor finished. I know, longest day of the year. And we just arrived at that moment. You keep that as alarm on your watch? This year, said Jake, yes. I do. He felt that tingling in the front of his head again and looked up. Outside the window, the sky was in full sunset. A reddish tinge colored the bottoms of the clouds that were now moving toward the horizon like sheep. It was a spectacular show.